I was very excited to be asked to uh, coordinate this book, uh, The 70 Great Mysteries of the Natural World. It was a chance to present uh, some of the latest research by scientists from all over the world about some of the most fundamental questions that really everybody is interested in. So this book is aimed at any uh, intelligent reader who's curious about uh, the, the nature of the earth and, and, and where they come from. And these are the kinds of questions that uh, people have been asking from the, the, the time of the ancient Greeks, Aristotle, uh, Bacon, Darwin. Great thinkers uh, have tried to present these views. I'm not claiming that I'm on their par. We're simply presenting a cross-section of these big topics for the general public. Um, and, and it tackles those questions of origins, the earth, uh, and the life on earth, and indeed the future of life on earth. There's a quote that we have at the beginning from Buckminster Fuller. Now there is one outstandingly important fact regarding spaceship earth, and that is that no instruction book came with it. Well, this is not quite the instruction book, but it's something like it, and, and it represents, it, not the final answer, and, and this is one of the characteristics of the book we seek to be honest with the reader. So this is not uh, a packaged textbook that says this is the age of the earth, this is the origin of life, this is where humans come from, full stop. The writers have made an effort to uh, explore what we know and what we don't know, and clearly that's, uh, that, that's what's exciting here. So there are four characteristics of this book, I think. First of all, it's authoritative. It's not written by one person. I'm not competent to write on the, the, this diversity of topics, so it was particularly uh, exciting for me to have the chance to select some of the world's best scientists. And these range from the very bright young scientists just entering the profession to distinguish older scientists, people with fellowships of the Royal Society and other distinctions of that kind. But these are world experts from every continent except Antarctica, um, young and old. Secondly, the book is lively and well illustrated, so we made sure that each piece was written to a certain standard. It's been very carefully checked and edited, so nobody rambles on at great length, as I probably am now. Thirdly, it is up to date, so that we are referring to the latest research right up to the moment of publication. Clearly, having authors who are masters and mistresses of their field, they know what's going on, and they're quoting stuff, some of which is barely published. And fourthly, as I mentioned before, it's honest, so we don't just say this is the end of the story, we know what we're talking about, that's that. Um, so we say what, what is known, what's not known. So the book is composed of seven sections, and we hope this covers the breadth of, of the, the, the natural world. First of all, we look at origins, and there are ten chapters covering the origin of the earth, the origin of life, uh, the origin of complex life, and all the different stages through to human evolution. And I think everybody knows that every week some new fossil is discovered which rewrites the whole story of human evolution. Maybe not quite true, but at least it's a fast-moving field. Secondly, we look at the Earth, the origin of the Earth, uh, the nature of volcanoes and earthquakes, tsunamis and other kinds of disasters, as well as other questions like uh, of an economic nature. Where does oil come from and coal and other human aspects? And simple questions like, is Mount Everest actually getting taller or not? People think it is, but actually it isn't terribly much. Thirdly, we look at evolution. This is, 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 is the binding uh, subject that, 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 that sits behind our knowledge of uh, life on Earth today. Um, and we look a little bit at some of the key evidence for evolution. Uh, we also then look at particular aspects of it, both from deep time, the ancient past, but mo very much at, at modern, the modern fields of molecular biology and genetics. Uh, which are revealing new information about how new species form, how, how, the, the, how, how the, the way we develop, the, the, the nature of the embryo through to the adult form, tells us a lot about uh, the, the pattern of evolution. And particular topics like, are our five fingers actually the primitive feature of all vertebrates? The answer is they're not, despite what you might have heard. Uh, fourth, we look at, we, fourthly, we look at biogeography and environments. We're, we're looking at distributions of organisms. We look at Darwin's finches, a very famous example of evolution, where Darwin and his colleagues were the first to spot that these remarkable little birds had lived on the Galapagos Islands for a relatively short amount of time, geologically speaking, and had evolved a remarkable array of adaptations. And they're, they're a classic study area where, where new information is coming to light all the time. But also we look on the larger scale, for example, why does South America 
have its own plants and animals that are not particularly shared with North America or Africa? Why is the fauna and flora of Australia so wildly different from what you might expect? But we also look at extremes, so it may be surprising for some that uh, there are microbes, for example, that can live in ice, that can live in boiling water, can live in acid, uh, and even at depths of three kilometers or more within rock. These are new discoveries, and it's important to try to understand them. Next, we look at plants and animals, and, and there are questions there. How do plants and animals work? How many species are there for a start? And actually, we don't really know. Uh, what are the limits on, on body size and activity? How fast can a racehorse run? Why can't they run faster now than they did 100 years ago, let's say? While we're talking about that, why do greyhounds go around corners at the same speed as they go in straight lines, but horses can't, and we can't. We would fall over if we tried that. How does your dog or your cat see you? Do they see you in colour, or do they see you in black and white? There are some startling, there's some startling new research in those sort of areas. Animal behaviour. How, uh, how, how do bees communicate? How, what, how is it that one bee can tell the rest of the hive where the nearest honey is? Um, how do butterflies and birds find their way home over thousands of kilometres during their migrations? Um, how, do, how does animal behaviour affect uh, the, the way they evolve? There, there are great uh, debates about uh, sexual selection, a field that Darwin also uh, talked about. How much of animal behaviour is instinct, automatic, and how much is a result of learning? And then finally, of course, we look at uh, the, 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 the state of the earth as a whole and the whole question of global warming in the future. And we want to know actually how do, how, how do the scientists who study Earth system science, how do they model the climate? How true is it? How, is it true that human beings have affected the climate on the Earth? And what will happen in the future? So we're trying to cover all of these rather remarkable and, and very important topics. And here and, here and there we hope that there are snippets of remarkable information. Uh, I mentioned the greyhounds. There is a question of what is the largest living organism? Not an elephant, not a whale, but a fungus. And the evidence is given in here. Um, and, and there are many other startling things. For example, if you're trying to understand the origin of life, there are indeed fossils, but those fossils are very hard to interpret, so it becomes a paradoxical question for those people who study the Precambrian. They want to find the simplest and oldest fossils of life. And yet, by the very fact that those fossils are simple and very old, they're going to be extremely hard to identify. And this, this subject, which only really started 50 years ago, uh, that this, this idea of trying to track these really ancient fossils, has led to a lot of excitement, a lot of announcements of discoveries. But <clears throat> every year or so, those older discoveries are often rejected, because regrettably, in, in their excitement to identify the fossils, uh, people can be misled by whiskers and modern microbes and bits and pieces on their microscope slides. So we have to be constantly alert, and that's a fast-moving topic as well. So, so we have the whole panoply of, of, of the Earth, of life on the Earth, of life in the past and of the present. The, the way the research is progressing, there are, of course, thousands, probably tens of thousands of scientists who are currently chasing these exciting topics. Some are of economic importance, some clearly like global warming and climate change are of great importance to, to mankind. Many are just interesting. They're just fascinating. We, we just really want to know these things, and, and that is the highest uh, possibility for human endeavor. My final point would be to say this book is published now uh, in time for the year 2009. 2009 is an important year because it's the 200th anniversary of Charles Darwin's birth and the 150th anniversary of the publication of The Origin of Species, which many people regard as one of the most important books ever published for the way it changed human thought. So that will be celebrated worldwide, in fact, in many ways. And I think it's important to realize that Darwin was a man of enlarged curiosity, as somebody described him. And this book is aimed at people uh, with, with, with brains of enlarged curiosity. They simply just want to know. So Darwin asked these questions about origins and why we are like we are, why there are so many species on the earth, where did they all come from, how does the earth work? Um, and I think celebrating Darwin, the fact is that what he did 150 years ago is by no means forgotten, it's not old-fashioned. He was asking the questions that we're still asking. He had many good ideas. He didn't have all the tools that we have now. There were no computers, the, the microscopes were less efficient, the analytical equipment was less good. He was asking the questions, 
These are the questions many people would be keen to understand now. And in the book, we try to present a very modern and up-to-date uh, position on all of these questions.